Hello everyone, welcome back to Learning English Pro. My name is Jer, I'm your online tutor and guide. In today's lesson, we're going to embark on a virtual journey together, exploring essential English phrases that you'll find incredibly useful when traveling. Whether you're planning a vacation, booking your trip, or immersing yourself in the sights and sounds of a new destination, communication is key. I've carefully curated a list of 70 practical sentences covering everything from making travel arrangements to experiencing new adventures and making memories. All the phrases covered in today's lesson are waiting for you in the video description if you want to follow along or revise after the lesson. And stick around after the lesson because I'm stacking this video with additional lessons I've already published on my YouTube channel. You could call this my travel masterclass in English. So if you're ready, let's begin our lesson with our 70 phrases. Our first topic is planning and deciding on a vacation. I want to go on a vacation soon. Do you prefer the beach or the mountains? I'm thinking of visiting Paris for the weekend. Should we take a road trip or fly? I'm planning a short trip next month. What's the best season to visit Japan? Let's do something adventurous this time. It's time to move on to our second topic, which is booking the trip. Can you help me find a good hotel? I'm booking our flights tonight. Should we rent a car or use public transportation? I'm looking for cheap flight tickets online. Do you want to book a hotel or an Airbnb? Can we get a discount on our booking? Let's check the visa requirements. Our third category is pre-travel preparations. Do I need to pack a formal outfit? Can you remind me to buy travel insurance? We should start packing our suitcases. Have we confirmed all our reservations? I need to exchange some money for the trip. Let's make a list of things to take. Should we check the weather forecast? Let's move on to our next section, which is at the airport. Where do we check in our luggage? Can I have a window seat, please? How long is the flight delay? Is there free Wi-Fi at the airport? Can I buy a bottle of water here? What time does boarding start? Do we need to fill out any forms? Our next section will cover phrases you can use on the plane. Can I get a blanket, please? Is there a vegetarian meal option? How do I adjust my seat? Can I switch my seat with you? What movies are available? Can I have some water, please? Are we landing soon? Let's move on to our next section, which deals with arrival and exploration. How do we get to the city centre from here? Can I have a map of the city? Where is a good place to eat nearby? Do you know the exchange rate? Can we buy tickets for the museum here? What's the best way to get around the city? Is there a guided tour available? 
Our seventh section covers activities and experiences. Do you want to try snorkeling? Can we book a day trip to the countryside? Where can we rent bicycles? Is the art gallery open today? Can we take photos here? Do you want to watch the sunset at the beach? How much does it cost to enter the national park? Our next section deals with rest and relaxation. Is there a spa at our hotel? Can we spend a day just relaxing by the pool? Where's a quiet place to read? Do you want to try yoga on the beach? Let's find a cosy cafe to unwind in. Should we book a massage? Is there a nice park for a picnic? Our penultimate section deals with challenges and ventures you may encounter when you're on your vacation. Can you speak English? I'm lost. Can you help me find my hotel? Do you know where the nearest pharmacy is? Can I use my credit card here? I need to find a doctor. Can you recommend one? How do I say thank you in your language? Can I drink the tap water? The final section in this part of the lesson is all about making memories. Let's buy souvenirs for our friends. Can you take a picture of us? This view is incredible. Let's stop here for a moment. I'm going to write a postcard to my family. We should wake up early to see the sunrise. Let's make a video of our trip. This has been an unforgettable journey. And that brings us to the end of this part of this lesson on travel. So next up, we're going to take a look at some airport vocabulary and phrases, which will be really useful to you if you're traveling by plane. From checking in to boarding and then to baggage claim, this video has you covered. So let's jump right into our lesson and our first category for the airport is check-in and boarding. I'd like to check in for my flight, please. I'd like to check in for my flight, please. I prefer a window seat. I prefer a window seat. Is my flight on schedule? Is my flight on schedule? Could you tell me the baggage allowance for this flight? Could you tell me the baggage allowance for this flight? I need to pay for extra luggage. I need to pay for extra luggage. I'm looking for gate number 12. I'm looking for gate number 12. Please let me know when boarding starts. Please let me know when boarding starts. I'm interested in an upgrade to business class. I'm interested in an upgrade to business class. Let's move on to our second category, which is the security check. Should I remove my belt? 
Should I remove my belt? Is this item allowed through security? Is this item allowed through security? I'll place my electronics in the tray. I'll place my electronics in the tray. Do I need to discard my water? Do I need to discard my water? I'm using the family security line. I'm using the family security line. Is there a priority lane for frequent flyers? Is there a priority lane for frequent flyers? It's time to move on to our third category, duty free and shopping. I'm heading to the duty free shop. I'm heading to the duty free shop. I would like to purchase some perfume. I would like to purchase some perfume. Do you accept credit cards? Do you accept credit cards? I'm looking for local souvenirs. I'm looking for local souvenirs. Is there a tourist discount? Is there a tourist discount? I'm interested in tax-free items. I'm interested in tax-free items. In our fourth category, we'll take a look at phrases and questions relating to dining and facilities. I need directions to the nearest restaurant. I need directions to the nearest restaurant. Which cafe do you recommend? Which cafe do you recommend? Please point me to the restrooms. Please point me to the restrooms. I'm looking for a charging station. I'm looking for a charging station. Is Wi Fi available here? Is Wi Fi available here? I need to find the smoking area. I need to find the smoking area. In our fifth category, we're going to cover boarding and departure. My flight has started boarding. My flight has started boarding. I heard there's a slight delay. I heard there's a slight delay. I'm locating my seat. I'm locating my seat. I'll put this in the overhead compartment. I'll put this in the overhead compartment. I'd appreciate a blanket and headphones. I'd appreciate a blanket and headphones. What's our estimated time of arrival? What's our estimated time of arrival? 
Next up, we have sentences and phrases relating to arrivals and baggage claim. I'm going to the baggage claim area. I'm going to the baggage claim area. I need to report a missing suitcase. I need to report a missing suitcase. Where can I find a luggage trolley? Where can I find a luggage trolley? Could you assist me with my luggage? Could you assist me with my luggage? Is there a lost and found office? Is there a lost and found office? In our seventh and final category, we'll take a look at a few sentences relating to transportation and transfers. Where's the taxi stand? Where's the taxi stand? I need directions to the city centre. I need directions to the city centre. Is there a shuttle service available? Is there a shuttle service available? Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Learning English Pro. In today's video, we're diving into the world of buses, exploring essential English vocabulary and useful phrases related to this common mode of transportation. So whether you're a beginner or looking to enhance your language skills, this video will help you confidently navigate bus journeys and conversations. If you want to follow along with this lesson, the word list and all the phrases are in the video description waiting for you. So, if you're ready, let's begin. Our first term is the bus stop. This is a designated location along a bus route where passengers can board or depart from buses. At the bus stop, it's very common to see a timetable or a schedule. This is a list of information about the bus, departure and arrival times at specific stops along a location, including bus numbers and other important information. Timetables or schedules help passengers to plan their journey and know when buses are expected to arrive. But sometimes there won't be any type of information at a bus stop. If this happens, you could ask someone in your most polite English. Excuse me, could you tell me when the next bus will come? Let's move on and cover some more terminology. The route of the bus is the specific path that a bus will take from its starting point to its destination. A route includes a sequence of stops and locations where passengers can board and depart. It outlines the journey the bus follows. The destination is the final stop to which the bus is traveling to. But sometimes you're not going to be sure exactly where the bus is going to go. So let's take a look at some more phrases. Excuse me, can you tell me which bus route I need to take to reach the airport? Or we could try. Excuse me, do you know if this bus goes to the city center? Sometimes instead of a bus stop, you'll need to go to a bus station to start your journey. A bus station is a facility where buses arrive and depart. Bus stations often have multiple platforms for different routes and destinations, and they provide amenities like waiting areas, ticket counters and restrooms. A bus ticket is a small piece of paper that serves as proof of payment for a bus journey. Passengers must present their tickets to the driver or use them to access the bus. So if you're at the bus station and you want to buy a ticket, what phrase would we use? Hello, I would like to buy a bus ticket to Manchester, please. It's as easy as that. 
Another type of bus ticket we can use is an electronic travel card. A travel card can also be referred to as a prepaid travel card. This is a reusable card that allows passengers to pay for multiple bus journeys without the need for individual tickets. Travel cards are really convenient and often offer cost savings for your travel. On lots of different bus journeys, you'll be able to pay in cash or coins. The amount of money you pay is called the fare. Fare rates can vary based on factors like distance traveled, types of ticket, and your passenger category, like an adult or child. The bus driver is the person responsible for operating the bus and ensuring the safety of passengers during the journey. Bus drivers follow the routes, collect fares, and assist passengers as needed. If you want to check how much your fare will be with the bus driver, you could say, Hello, I need to go to the city centre. How much will that be, please? When you get on the bus, you'll see lots of passengers. Passengers are individuals who travel on a bus, just like you. In fact, everyone who travels on the bus is called a passenger, except of course for the bus driver. When on the bus, you may interact with a handrail or a hand grip. These are supports for passengers to hold on to while standing or moving within the bus. These safety features are generally located above seats or along the aisles. So eventually it's going to come time for you to get off the bus. And for that you're going to use the stop button. This is a button located inside the bus that passengers can press to signal to the driver that they want to disembark. So this will indicate to the driver that they will need to stop at the next available bus stop. Before we finish up the lesson, let's take a look at two more phrases you can use during your travels on the bus. When an older person gets on the bus and there is no other seats available, it is etiquette to offer your seat to this person. And the phrase we would use is quite simple. Would you like to take my seat? It's really easy to be very polite. Another way we can be polite is to thank the bus driver when you're exiting the bus. And you can simply say, thank you, have a great day. Hello there language learners and welcome back to Learning English Pro. In today's video, we're going to take a journey through the airport, exploring essential English vocabulary that will help you navigate your way through terminals, gates and flights with confidence. Don't worry if you miss any of the terms, I've got you covered. The complete word list and definitions will be waiting for you in the video description below. So if you're ready, let's dive right in. Let's start with the basics. A terminal is a building at the airport where passengers check in, go through security and wait for their flights. If an airport has multiple terminals, you may have a situation where one terminal could be for domestic flights and another specifically for international flights. Our next term is departure. This refers to the act of leaving and in the context of the airport, it's when you leave for your flight. And the area or floor that you go to at the airport for this will simply be called departures. Arrival, on the other hand, is the act of reaching your destination. It's when you land at your destination airport. And like the departures area, there will be another floor or area called arrivals. Check-in is the process of registering your presence at the airport before a flight. This is usually done in the check-in area. It typically involves providing your flight details and information. In many cases, this procedure can be done online through the airline's website or mobile app before even arriving at the airport. And if you have bags you need to check in, it might be time to do that now. So you can do this sometimes at the check-in counter or there might be a specific area called a baggage drop-off or bag drop. During the check-in process, you may receive your boarding pass. This is a document that allows you to board your flight. It includes important details like your seat number and departure gate. If you have checked in online, your boarding pass may be on your phone or you might have it printed out. You must keep this document in your possession for the duration of your journey. 
Once you have all that business out of the way, it's time to go through the security check. Before you board your flight, you need to go through this check. This is where your belongings are screened for safety reasons. Luggage is generally scanned by an x-ray machine and it may be searched or inspected. Similarly, passengers are also screened and may be physically searched if the machine detects something unusual. Sometimes after security check or at some point in the airport, you may have to go through passport control. At passport control, officials check your passport or visa and other travel documents to allow you to enter or exit a country. Duty free shops are stores at the airport where you can buy goods without paying certain taxes or duties. Shops in this area usually sell high value goods such as perfume, technology, sunglasses and other luxury items. A concourse is a long corridor within the terminal that leads to various departure gates. And the gate is the specific area where you will board your plane. It's important to know your gate number to make sure you're in the right place. There is usually seating in this area for waiting passengers and typically there will be a desk manned by airline staff. Soon enough it'll be time for boarding. Boarding refers to the process of entering the plane to take your assigned seat and prepare for departure. It involves presenting your boarding pass, showing identification and walking through the jet bridge or the aircraft to settle into your seat for the flight. During this process, you'll encounter the cabin crew or the flight crew. These are the members of the airline staff who will take care of you and other passengers during the flight. Takeoff refers to the moment when an aircraft leaves the ground and begins its ascent into the air. During takeoff, the aircraft gains speed on the runway and its lift increases until it becomes airborne. The term in flight refers to everything that happens during your time on the plane from takeoff to landing. Landing is the controlled descent of an aircraft onto the runway or landing surface at an airport. It's the opposite of takeoff. After you land, something you may need to do is go through immigration. Immigration is the process of checking your passport and other documents when entering a new country. After this, you'll generally head to the baggage claim area. This is where you collect your checked in luggage. And before you exit the airport, you might have to go through customs. Customs is where your luggage and belongings might be inspected by authorities to ensure you're not carrying any prohibited items. Today we're diving into the exciting world of vacations. Whether you're planning a getaway or just want to expand your vocabulary, this video is for you. In this video, you'll learn lots of new vocabulary along with their definitions, and I'll provide an example sentence for each word. Be sure to check out the word list in the video description for quick reference. And remember, if you notice any differences between American and British English, I've got you covered. Let's get started with our lesson, and first up we have Wanderlust. This is that irresistible urge to travel, explore new places and experience different cultures. It's that feeling you get when you can't resist the call of adventure. Our example sentence is, After years of working, I finally gave in to my Wanderlust and booked a solo trip around Europe. Next we have Staycation. This term refers to taking time off from work and simply relaxing at home or exploring your local area. It's like a mini vacation without the need for travel. Our example sentence is, I decided to have a staycation this year, enjoying my city's museums, parks and local eateries. Have you ever felt groggy after a long flight? That's jet lag. It's that temporary sleep disorder that happens when your body's internal clock is out of sync with the time zone you're in. I couldn't shake off my jet lag for days after flying halfway around the world. Ah, souvenirs. These are keepsakes or mementos you bring back from your travels to remind you of places you visited. They come in all shapes and sizes, from keychains to local handicrafts. 
I bought a beautiful hand painted plate as a souvenir from my trip to Morocco. An itinerary is your travel schedule or plan. It outlines the activities, places to visit, and events you'll experience during your vacation. It's like a travel roadmap. Our detailed itinerary included visits to historic sites, culinary tours, and even a hot air balloon ride. Backpacking is an adventurous way of traveling, often on a budget. You pack light, carry a backpack, and explore various destinations, experiencing different cultures up close. Let's check out our example sentence. We spent three months backpacking through Southeast Asia, immersing ourselves in local traditions and trying street food along the way. Imagine everything you need for a perfect vacation bundled into one package. That's an all-inclusive deal. It typically includes accommodation, meals, drinks, and sometimes even activities, allowing you to relax without worrying about extra expenses. We treated ourselves to an all-inclusive resort in the Caribbean, where we enjoyed unlimited access to the beach, pool, and gourmet dining. Sightseeing is a must-do activity during vacations. It involves visiting popular landmarks, historical sites, and attractions in the area to truly experience its beauty and culture. We spent the whole day sightseeing in Rome, exploring the Colosseum, Vatican City, and charming cobblestone streets. Spending too much time under the sun without protection can lead to sunburn, it's a painful skin condition caused by excessive exposure to ultraviolet rays. I forgot to reapply sunscreen and now I'm dealing with a painful sunburn on my shoulders. If you love nature and adventure, hiking is the way to go. Lace up your boots, grab your backpack and explore the great outdoors by walking through trails and enjoying breathtaking views. Our example sentence is we spent the weekend hiking in the National Park, reaching the summit just in time to catch a stunning sunrise. In British English, we use the term queue to refer to standing in line. So when you're patiently waiting your turn for that amazing attraction, you're actually in a queue. Our example sentence is, we joined the queue early to make sure we got tickets to the popular art exhibit. Here's an interesting difference between American and British English. Americans often say vacation to refer to time off work, while in British English they say holiday. So whether you're planning your dream vacation or holiday, it's all about unwinding and having a great time. In American English, our example sentence is, I can't wait for my vacation next month. I'm going to relax on the beach and forget about work. Our example for British English is, in about two weeks, we will go on holiday to Madrid. I am looking forward to trying some tapas. Another American-British English distinction, luggage and baggage. Both terms refer to your suitcases and bags, but luggage is more commonly used in American English, while baggage is more frequently heard in British English. Let's use both terms in the same sentence. I struggled to carry all my baggage through the airport, but luckily the hotel had luggage carts. In American English, they say elevator when they want to reach a different floor in a building. In British English, they say lift. So whether you're hitting the elevator or calling the lift, you're on your way up. Let's try elevator in an example sentence. I pressed the button for the elevator and waited patiently for it to arrive. Finally, we have postcards. These are lovely little cards you send to friends and family from your vacation spot. They usually feature a picture of a scenic view or landmark, giving your loved ones a glimpse of your travels. I'm sending a postcard with a picture of the Eiffel Tower to my grandparents to let them know how amazing Paris is.
today we're going to dive into a vibrant and exciting word list all about summer. So get ready to enrich your English vocabulary with 15 words associated with the warmest season of the year. And as usual, I'm posting the complete word list and sentence examples in the description below. Let's get started with our lesson. And let's begin with sunshine. It refers to the bright and warm rays of the sun that light up our summer days. Our first example sentence is, The children played in the park, basking in the warm sunshine. Let's move on to the beach. It's a sandy paradise where the land meets the sea, offering the perfect spot for relaxation and fun. We could say, we're planning a family vacation at the beach to enjoy the sun, sand and surf. Swimming is a refreshing activity that allows us to cool off in pools, lakes or the ocean during hot summer days. Let's take a look at the example sentence. After a long day of hiking, we took a dip in the clear blue lake, enjoying a refreshing swimming session. Who doesn't love ice cream? It's a delicious frozen treat that helps us beat the summer heat. On a scorching afternoon, I treated myself to a double scoop of chocolate ice cream. BBQ stands for barbecue, a popular outdoor cooking method during the summer where we grill delicious food on an open flame. We're having a barbecue party this weekend, inviting friends over for grilled burgers and hot dogs. A picnic is a fun outdoor activity where we enjoy a meal in nature, often surrounded by beautiful scenery. Our example sentence is, the park is the perfect spot for a picnic. We'll pack some sandwiches, fruits and drinks. Summer is a popular time for vacations when many people take a break from work or school to travel and explore new destinations. We're planning a dream vacation to a tropical island, looking forward to sandy beaches and clear waters. The sunset marks the end of a summer day, painting the sky with breathtaking hues of orange, pink and purple. Our example sentence is, As we sat on the hillside, we watched the mesmerizing sunset over the horizon. Summer brings a vibrant display of flowers, adding colour and beauty to gardens and landscapes. The backyard was full of stunning flowers, thanks to the talents of the gardener. Flip-flops are casual and comfortable footwear, perfect for summer days, especially at the beach or poolside. We could say, I wore my flip-flops at the pool and also at the beach. They are very comfortable. The gentle breeze is a cool and refreshing wind that offers relief from the summer heat. Sitting on the porch, I enjoyed the soothing breeze while sipping iced tea. A sun hat is a wide-brimmed hat that provides shade and protects us from the sun's rays. Our example sentence is, Don't forget to wear a sun hat when you go hiking to shield yourself from the sun. Fireworks light up the night sky during summer celebrations, adding a spectacular display of colours and patterns. We celebrated Independence Day with a grand display of fireworks that amazed everyone. Summer is the season of adventure when we explore new activities, places and experiences. During summer break, I'm planning to go on an adventure trip, trying out water sports and hiking. Sunblock is a crucial product to protect our skin from the sun's harmful UV rays during summer. We could say, 
Remember to apply sunblock before going to the beach to avoid sunburn. In this lesson, we'll be learning essential clothes shopping phrases for English learners. So you'll learn lots of useful English to help you buy your next outfit. So let's jump into our first category, finding the right size and fit. Do you have this in a smaller size? Do you have this in a smaller size? Do you have this in a larger size? Do you have this in a larger size? Can I try this on? Can I try this on? Where is the fishing room? Where is the fishing room? Does this come in different colors? Does this come in different colors? Is this available in my size? Is this available in my size? How does this fit? How does this fit? In our second category, we'll take a look at some questions you can use when asking for advice. What would you recommend for a formal event? What would you recommend for a formal event? Can you suggest a good outfit for the summer? Can you suggest a good outfit for the summer? What style is in fashion right now? What style is in fashion right now? Do these shoes match this dress? Do these shoes match this dress? Which of these is more casual? Which of these is more casual? Can you help me find a winter coat? Can you help me find a winter coat? In our next category, we'll take a look at questions you can ask when checking prices and offers. How much does this cost? How much does this cost? Is this on sale? Is this on sale? Do you offer any discounts? Do you offer any discounts? Can I get a refund if it doesn't fit? Can I get a refund if it doesn't fit? Do you have a loyalty program? Do you have a loyalty program? Are there any ongoing promotions? Are there any ongoing promotions? In our fourth category, we'll take a look at questions you can ask about quality and material. 
What material is this made of? What material is this made of? Is this machine washable? Is this machine washable? Does this color fade after washing? Does this color fade after washing? Is this sweater 100% wool? Is this sweater 100% wool? Can you tell me more about the fabric quality? Can you tell me more about the fabric quality? Is this waterproof? Is this waterproof? In our fifth and final category, we'll take a look at some phrases and questions you can use when making a purchase. I would like to buy this, please. I would like to buy this, please. Can I pay by credit card? Can I pay by credit card? Do you offer gift wrapping? Do you offer gift wrapping? Where can I check out? Where can I check out? Can I have a bag, please? Can I have a bag, please? Is there a warranty on this product? Is there a warranty on this product? Hi everyone, I hope you are well. In this English lesson, we will be exploring the world of retail and learning the English names of different types of shops and stores. In fact, you will learn 60 terms in this lesson. There are lots of differences between American and British English, which I will also share with you. As usual, I am posting the word list in the description below. Make sure to check it out and revise the vocabulary after the video. And don't forget to subscribe. Let's jump straight into our lesson. In American English, a building where goods are sold is called a store, while in British English, it is called a shop. However, this isn't a strict rule. Americans may use the term shop to describe a smaller store which sells a specific item. And this difference impacts the way that most of the stores are called in each region. A good example is the bookstore or bookshop. This is a retail unit which sells books. So in American English, we have a bookstore, all one word, or in British English, bookshop, again, all one word. Some shops will have a specific name, like a butcher. A butcher is a specialized store which prepares and sells raw meat. Our next type of store bakes and prepares bread-based products. It's called a bakery. Let's move on and our next store provides a service to cut men's hair. It's called a barber shop in American English and in British English it's referred to as the barbers. And for women's hair, in American English the store is called a hair salon and in British English it's called a hairdresser's. The next store we will look at is called a cafe which offers beverages such as coffee and tea and perhaps some pastries. In British English, it might be referred to as a coffee shop, and in American English, it might be referred to as a coffee house. If you're looking for something sweet like confectionery, you should go to the candy shop. This is what it's called in American English. In British English, it's called a sweet shop. 
For any type of clothing, in America you would be looking for a clothing store. In British English, it's called a clothes shop. A smaller clothes shop or clothing store, which may provide a particular type of clothing or indeed is one which belongs to a specific designer, may be called a boutique. In most regions, the store where you buy your medicine is called a pharmacy. In lots of places in America, pharmacies are located within a drugstore which sells medicines and other products. In British English, a synonym of pharmacy is chemist, which is commonly used. Let's move on to some food stores, and our next store is called a delicatessen, or a deli for short. This is a shop which sells cooked meats, cheeses, and unusual or foreign prepared foods. And in lots of delis, especially in the US, you can pick up a pretty good sandwich. A store which sells only cheeses and specializes in cheeses is known as a cheese monger. A monger is an old word for a tradesperson. Another type of monger which you may hear of is a fishmonger, and this is a person who trades in fish. A store which sells only fruits and vegetables is called a greengrocers in British English and a produce store in American English. A general food store is known as a grocery store. And a bigger type of grocery store which sells food and almost everything else is called a supermarket. Supermarkets and lots of the stores discussed in today's video can be found in a shopping mall. This is American English and it's generally just referred to as the mall. In British English, it's referred to as a shopping centre. Where you have lots of vendors or traders selling their items on a street, this is known as a street market. If the market is focused on farmers selling their own produce, it is referred to as a farmer's market. A store that sells tools and machinery and other durable equipment is known as a hardware store in American English and a hardware shop in British English. A store that sells flowers and bouquets and can arrange flowers for you is known as a florist. For newspapers and magazines, you would visit a newsstand in America. These are the small kiosks that can be found in major cities across the country. In British English, these shops are known as newsagents. And they sell just about everything. They may also be called a corner shop. If you are in need of a ring or necklace or any type of jewellery, you would visit the jewellery store in US English. In British English, this type of store would simply be called the jewellers. Note the difference in spelling. Jewellery and related words in British English has two L's, while in American English they only have one L. A store which sells alcoholic beverages is known as a liquor store in American English. In British English, it is known as an off license. If you partake in sports, fitness and exercise, you would look for a sports store in American English, or it may be referred to as a sporting goods store. In British English, it would be referred to as a sports shop. Our next type of shop is commonly found in tourist areas in major cities, a gift shop. These are typically full of trinkets and memorabilia for you to purchase for a loved one. Like the term gift shop, most shops and stores are simply referred to by what they sell. Let's take a look at some other examples. So a store which sells pet related products would be called a pet store or pet shop. Next up we have shoe store or shoe shop. Or how about electronic store? or electronic shop, toy store, toy shop. Let's try a few more, furniture store or furniture shop. How about art store or art shop? Some stores will only sell one item like a piano store or a piano shop.
Hello everyone, welcome back to another edition of Learning English Pro. We are exploring the world of shopping and retail and focusing on the subject of phrasal verbs relating to purchasing and looking at items in a store. So you'll find lots of really interesting English sentences to practice English speaking here in this lesson. With each different phrasal verb that we cover in today's video, I will be giving you six examples in six different tenses, which will be listed on screen for you. So with this in mind, let's get started on our English lesson. And our first phrasal verb is to pick out. The definition of this is to choose something from a number of alternatives. Okay, let's move on and take a look at all our different sentence examples. I picked out a new car last week. I picked out a new car last week. I pick out the best clothes in every sale. I pick out the best clothes in every sale. She always picks out the best from our selection. She always picks out the best from our selection. I have picked out a really nice jacket. I have picked out a really nice jacket. I will pick out a belt in the store tomorrow. I will pick out a belt in the store tomorrow. At the moment, I am picking out a new suit. At the moment, I am picking out a new suit. For our next phrasal verb, we are going to UK English with splash out. This phrasal verb means to spend money freely, to spend a lot of money. Let's check out some of those example sentences. I splashed out on some new clothes. I splashed out on some new clothes. I splash out on an expensive holiday once a year. I splash out on an expensive holiday once a year. My mother splashes out on gifts every Christmas. My mother splashes out on gifts every Christmas. I have splashed out on clothes too much. I have splashed out on clothes too much. I will splash out and buy something nice. I will splash out and buy something nice. I am splashing out on a new car for the family. I am splashing out on a new car for the family. Let's move right along to our next phrasal verb, which is to pay for. And this means to give someone or something money that is due for work done, goods received, or a debt incurred. The verb to pay is an irregular verb, so pay close attention to how this verb changes in the past tenses. I paid for my shopping and went home. I paid for my shopping and went home. I usually pay for my food shopping with cash. I usually pay for my food shopping with cash. My friend pays for her child to go to dance lessons. My friend pays for her child to go to dance lessons. I have already paid for everyone's meal. I have already paid for everyone's meal. I will pay for my ticket at the box office. I will pay for my ticket at the box office. I am paying for everyone to go to the movies. I am paying for everyone to go to the movies. Our next phrasal verb is to look out for. And this means to search for and produce something, to be vigilant and take notice. Our first sentence example for this phrasal verb is I looked out for a green hat but didn't find one. I looked out for a green hat but didn't find one. I always look out for pink roses in the florist. I always look out for pink roses in the florist. My dad looks out for antiques when he shops. My dad looks out for antiques 
when he shops. I have looked out for that book before. I have looked out for that book before. I will look out for that vase when I'm in town. I will look out for that vase when I'm in town. I'm looking out for a nice pair of sunglasses. I'm looking out for a nice pair of sunglasses. Next up, we have two phrasal verbs, which mean the same thing. In UK English, we have queue up and in American English, we have line up and they both mean to wait in a queue or line up for something. For our sentence examples, I'm going to use queue up. I queued up for hours to buy tickets to the show. I queued up for hours to buy tickets to the show. I queue up every morning for my coffee at the cafe. I queue up every morning for my coffee at the cafe. She queues up for every sale that the store holds. She queues up for every sale that the store holds. I have queued up for many hours for that promotion. I have queued up for many hours for that promotion. I will queue up later after I get some more fruit. I will queue up later after I get some more fruit. I am queuing up to purchase these gifts. I am queuing up to purchase these gifts. Are you ready for another phrasal verb? This one is to shop around, and it means to look out for the most suitable item or service for the lowest price. Let's take a look at these sentence examples. I shopped around for the best deal. I shopped around for the best deal. I always shop around for the best price on food. I always shop around for the best price on food. She shops around for a great price before she decides to buy. She shops around for a great price before she decides to buy. I have shopped around for a better quote in the past. I have shopped around for a better quote in the past. I will shop around for a new car later this week. I will shop around for a new car later this week. I am shopping around for a pair of red shoes. I am shopping around for a pair of red shoes. Let's move right along to our next phrasal verb, which is to try on. And it means to put on an item of clothing to see if it fits or suits you. I tried on a pair of black jeans. I tried on a pair of black jeans. I try on shirts before I buy them. I try on shirts before I buy them. My brother tries on his suits to make sure they fit properly. My brother tries on his suits to make sure they fit properly. The bride has already tried on several dresses. The bride has already tried on several dresses. My mother will try on a few scarves in the store. My mother will try on a few scarves in the store. I am trying on this outfit to see if it fits me. I am trying on this outfit to see if it fits me. Pop into is a phrasal verb which means to go into some place very briefly. I popped into the grocery store today. I popped into the grocery store today. I pop into the city for shopping once a month. I pop into the city for shopping once a month. She pops in and buys some groceries every week. She pops in and buys some groceries every week. I have popped into that store on several occasions. I have popped into that store on several occasions. I will pop into the clothing store later for a dress. 
I will pop into the clothing store later for a dress. I am popping into the mall today to buy a hat. I am popping into the mall today to buy a hat. Our penultimate of phrasal verb is to check out. In the context of shopping, it means to complete a purchase by providing payment at the final point of sale, as in a retail store. I checked out in the store and went home. I checked out in the store and went home. I check out with my favourite cashier every day. I check out with my favourite cashier every day. She checks out within a few minutes of arriving. She checks out within a few minutes of arriving. I have checked out already and I'm leaving the store. I have checked out already and I'm leaving the store. I will check out my goods in a few minutes. I will check out my goods in a few minutes. I am checking out my shopping and will pay with cash. I am checking out my shopping and will pay with cash. Our final phrasal verb for this lesson is sell out. We use this phrasal verb when we talk about a stock of something, meaning to become completely depleted due to every item having been sold out. The verb to sell is an irregular verb, so pay attention to how it changes in the past tenses. The jackets sold out and are out of stock. The jackets sold out and are out of stock. The strawberries sell out whenever we have them. The strawberries sell out whenever we have them. The umbrella is cheap and it sells out when it rains. The umbrella is cheap and it sells out when it rains. In the past, her handbags have sold out very quickly. In the past, her handbags have sold out very quickly. The stock will sell out at this price. The stock will sell out at this price. All of the different types of shoes are selling out. All of the different types of shoes are selling out. Welcome to Learning English Pro. In this vocabulary video, I'll take you on a virtual shopping spree as I explore the mall. Enhance your English language skills with essential nouns related to the American shopping experience. So if you're ready, let's dive in and start our lesson. And of course, our first word is mall. This describes a large shopping center with various stores and facilities. Our example sentences, my friends and I love spending weekends at the mall, shopping for the latest fashion trends. Up next, we have the word boutique. A boutique is a small shop that sells stylish and exclusive items, often related to fashion. The example sentence is, she found a stunning dress at a boutique in the mall for the upcoming party. Let's move on to department store. A department store is a large retail store that offers a wide range of products organized into different departments. The department store at the mall has everything from clothes to electronics and home decor. Let's move on to my favorite area in the mall, the food court. This is an area where various food vendors are located, offering different cuisines. Let's check out our example sentence. Let's grab a quick bite at the food court before continuing our shopping spree. Our next word is escalator. This is the moving staircase that transports people between different levels or floors in the mall. After walking around for hours, my tired feet welcomed the sight of the escalator. Let's move on to restroom. 
This is a public facility in the mall where people can use the toilet and wash their hands. Our example sentence is Excuse me, can you tell me where the restrooms are located? Our next word is every shopper's favourite. Sales. This is a period of time when stores offer discounts and reduce prices on their products. I bought these shoes during the summer sales at the mall and I got a fantastic deal. Our next term is a fun activity you can do at the mall. Window shopping. This is the act of looking at items in store windows without intending to make a purchase. We could say, when I'm bored, I enjoy going to the mall and doing some window shopping. ATM stands for Automated Teller Machine. This is a device that allows people to withdraw cash from their bank accounts. I need to find an ATM in the mall to get some money for lunch. Our next word is elevator. This is the mechanical lift that moves people between different floors in the mall or any building. We could say, if you have strollers or heavy bags, the elevator is more convenient than the escalator. Another one of my favourite places in the mall is the cinema. This is a movie theatre where films are shown for public entertainment. Our example sentence is, after shopping, we decided to catch a movie at the mall's cinema. Our final term for this video is parking garage. This is a multi-level structure where visitors can park their vehicles while visiting the mall. Our final example sentence is, finding a spot in the parking garage during the weekends can be quite challenging. We are exploring the world of restaurants and focusing on restaurant vocabulary. Let's jump right into our subject and there's lots to cover in this lesson. So let's begin with alcohol. There are lots of different types of alcohol sold in restaurants, but the main one you will find is wine. And it is very common to see beer served in restaurants as well. And some restaurants will even offer cocktails. These are mixed alcoholic beverages. A good restaurant will have its alcohol listed on a wine menu or a wine list. Wine is typically sold by the glass or by the bottle. It is common to buy one or two bottles of wine for a table. Bigger restaurants will have a bar. This is where the alcoholic drinks are prepared and served. And for those who do not drink alcohol, there's lots of other beverages available, like water and sodas. Let's move on to our next area of interest. When you order food, you do it from a menu. And there exists lots of different types of menus. In fact, some restaurants will have more than one. Most restaurants are à la carte. This is a French term we use in English. And it means that you can pick anything you want from the menu, as much or as little. You can also have a fixed menu where the meals are already chosen for you. A restaurant may also have a du jour menu, another French term. Du jour means of the day, and it can mean an item served in a restaurant on a particular day. An early bird menu is a dinner served earlier than traditional dinner hours. There can be a smaller selection and a cheaper price. And the lunch menu details what a restaurant offers during lunchtime. If you're visiting a fast food restaurant, your food options will be on a display board and you will order your food at the counter. And this is done with a server. Server is a term we can use generally to describe people who serve you in a restaurant. A waiter is a male server, while a waitress is a female server. And a term we can use for a group of servers is wait staff. A restaurant can have lots of different roles, like the host. 
This is the person who may greet you when you enter a restaurant. They may also take you to your table. And this is the person you will call if you need to make a reservation or a booking. We can also use the term to reserve a table. Let's move on to our next role, which is another French term, the maitre d'. This role can be found in bigger, expensive restaurants. Like a host, the maitre d' can greet guests, but they can be also responsible for maintaining the dining room area and ensuring that it is clean and presentable. Earlier, I mentioned the bar and the types of alcohol and beverages you can purchase in a restaurant. The person who prepares these beverages is called the bartender. Another person that you may see in the restaurant area is the bus boy. This is the person who removes dirty dishes, cleans the table and gets it ready for the next customers. In the kitchen, the most important person is the chef. They are the person who decides the menu and oversees most of the cooking of the food. Another term for chef is cook. A chef is someone who is typically trained in a college or university, while a cook is someone who is seen as being trained on the job. Let's move right along to the seating arrangements and of course we have the table and chair. If you have a little one with you, you may need to get a booster seat or a high chair. And on your table, you'll typically have a plate and you'll eat your food with a fork, knife and spoon. And you'll typically find a napkin on the table as well. For bread and side dishes, you will have a side plate. What else can we have on the dinner table? Wine is served in a wine glass and there is a distinction between a red wine glass and a white wine glass. Other beverages like sodas and water are served in a glass. To be more specific, you could refer to it as a drinking glass. And some places like a fast food restaurant or a cafe will offer their beverages in a cup. When it comes to coffee, your coffee may be served in a particular cup called a coffee cup. And for tea, we have the same principle, a tea cup. Tea will often be served in restaurants in a teapot. Another thing which is essential in restaurants is condiments. These are the sauces that we add to our food. They include ketchup, mayonnaise, oil and vinegar. And we can't forget the other two condiments, which usually come as a pair, salt and pepper. So it's about time we got to the subject of food. Food is served as a course in a restaurant. A course may include multiple dishes or only one, and often includes items with some variety of flavors. A course can also be referred to as a plate or a portion. All of these words are used in lots of different ways in different restaurants. You could have a pasta course, a salad plate, or a portion of fries, depending on which restaurant you're in. Some restaurants will offer something as a slice, like a slice of pizza or a slice of cake. Let's get back to this term of course, though. In a more formal restaurant, you may have a first course. In American English, this is referred to as an appetizer, and in British English, it is referred to as a starter. And this is usually a small dish, like a salad or a soup. After the first course, you typically have a main course. This may also be referred to as the main dish. In most restaurants, this would be the meat course. You would typically have beef, chicken, pork, or some other type of meat. After the main course, it's time for something sweet with the dessert course, where you can pick your favorite dessert. Some restaurants will have a dessert menu. When you have a starter, a main course, and a dessert, this is known as a three course meal. Some restaurants will have additional courses, like a soup course. This can be typically served after an appetizer and usually comes with bread. And for eating soup, you need a soup spoon. At your restaurant of choice, there may also be a salad course.
Depending on the style of restaurant you go to, they may have a salad bar where you serve yourself your own salad. Another course which is more common in Mediterranean countries is a fish course. Lots of restaurants will offer a fish of the day. Any type of fish sold in a restaurant is known as seafood. And we also have the term of shellfish. This covers animals like crab, lobster and shrimp. Other meals offered at a restaurant include breakfast. And breakfast can include meals which are sweet or savoury. After breakfast, we have a meal which is a combination of breakfast and lunch. Brunch. Brunch is a popular weekend meal you can have with your friends and family. And lots of restaurants will offer a lunch menu where you can have soup and a sandwich or grab a quick salad. In the evening, a restaurant will offer dinner. And in some places, a dinner may be referred to as supper. When you've reached the end of your meal, it's time to ask for the bill. This will give you the total cost of your meal and indicate that you want to give payment for it. Most restaurants will take payment of cash or credit or debit card, but it's good to check beforehand just in case. And depending on the country and culture you're in, you may need to leave a tip for your server. Some restaurants will let you take your leftover food home in a doggy bag. If this is something that you want, you can ask for the food to go. Any good restaurant will wrap up the food and let you take it home with you to enjoy later. We are exploring the world of restaurants and focusing on how we discuss and describe different types of restaurants in this lesson. You will find lots of really useful English words and terms here. So without further ado, let's jump straight into our lesson and discuss different types of restaurants. First up, we have fine dining. With fine dining, there is a rating system known as the Michelin star. If a restaurant has a Michelin star, it is very well thought of and probably very expensive. With these restaurants, it's important to note that there is generally a dress code. This means that you can't wear casual clothes and that you must dress up and wear nice formal wear. Fine dining restaurants can be described as upscale and expensive. And it's common with these types of restaurants to have several courses. Your entire experience in a fine dining restaurant should be filled with elegance and you should feel a level of exclusivity. Have you ever been to a fine dining restaurant? Let me know about your experience in the comments below. Our next type of restaurant is casual dining. This type of restaurant has a relaxed atmosphere. And they're a bit better for your pocket, being more moderately priced. A lot of casual dining restaurants will have interesting decor. And like most restaurants, customers are served at the table. And this is done by a server or a waiter. Our next type of restaurant is a fast food restaurant. A lot of fast food restaurants operate as a franchise business. And they are known for their cheap prices. As well as the speed of service, you'll get your food really quickly. Food is ordered at the counter and delivered at the counter. A lot of fast food restaurants now offer self-service. And once a customer has gotten their food, they seat themselves. You can also collect fast food at the drive through This term is sometimes shortened, especially in American English, to through, T-H or U. You can see this on screen. Our next type of restaurant is probably my favourite, the buffet. Buffet is a French word in origin, so we do not pronounce the T. Buffet. Buffets generally have a fixed price and are considered all you can eat. You pay one price and you can eat as much food as you can manage. And buffets typically carry multiple cuisines, meaning that you can get a little bit of everything. It's probably why I like them so much. If you're looking for street food, a convenient way to get a tasty meal is a food truck. This can also be called a food cart. These are both American English. In British English, it would be referred to as a food van. 
Something which is similar to this and you might see in a marketplace is a food stand. With these types of food vendors, there is usually one type of food, so it has a limited menu. And the focus again is on speed, like fast food. Let's move on to a different type of restaurant, the cafe. And of course, the cafe is well known as a place where you can get your coffee or different types of beverages. Most cafes will do food, especially sweet stuff like pastries and cakes, as well as savoury options like sandwiches. Some cafes will specialise in different foods. One of my favourite cafes in Dublin has a huge selection of desserts and I often go in there for a nice treat. Lots of cafes will have outdoor seating along with a unhurried atmosphere. Cafes usually have very loyal customers, so if you go to the same one, you might see the same faces over and over. In Ireland and the UK, a common place to get food is a pub or a gastropub. So along with your alcoholic beverages, you can usually pick up a pretty good meal. And generally, you can order your food from your table with table service. Our next type of restaurant is a cafeteria, which is common in schools and workplaces. A cafeteria is like a buffet, but with servers, people who dish out the food to you. Or we say the food is dished up. So you'll need a tray to keep your dish on and bring it to your own table. Our next type of restaurant is quintessentially American, the diner. These types of restaurants are famous for their booth seating, and the cuisine usually contains food associated with American culture, so lots of fried foods. With diners in the US, they are very popular for breakfast, but lots of diners are open 24 hours a day, so you can get lots of different types of meals throughout the day in an American diner. In this lesson, we'll be exploring English words relating to lots of different places in the city. Get ready to learn over 50 new terms with differences highlighted between American and British English. In this lesson for beginners, we're really going to focus on our pronunciation. So listen closely to how I pronounce the words and make sure to repeat after me. The first place you may visit in the city is the airport. Repeat after me. Airport. Or perhaps you may arrive at a city at the train station. Train station. If you come by bus, you may arrive at the bus station. Repeat after me. Bus station. If you arrive to a city by boat or ship, you can arrive at its port. This can also be called a harbour. When it comes to transport in a city, an important place is the subway. Sometimes it can be referred to as the underground. And in lots of places, especially in Europe, it will be called the metro. For those travelling by car or around the city with a car, a parking lot is an essential place. This is the American English. In British English, it is referred to as a car park. Another essential place in the city for those using a car is the gas station. And again, this is American English. In British English, it is referred to as a petrol station. A common place to stay if you're in the city is a hotel. Repeat after me. Hotel. A popular place to visit is the museum. Repeat after me. Museum. And it's hard to resist a trip to the shopping mall. This is the American English. In British English, it's referred to as a shopping centre. 
Streets that are common for shopping are called the high street. Repeat after me. High street. A more traditional place to buy products is the market. Repeat after me. Market. As a tourist in the city, you may visit a landmark. This is an object or a feature of a landscape or town which has historical or cultural significance and is easily seen and recognized from a distance. A type of landmark is a monument. A monument is a statue building or other structure erected to commemorate a notable person or an event. A popular destination in lots of cities is the zoo. This is an establishment which maintains a collection of wild animals. And did you know there is estimated to be around 10,000 zoos around the world. Similar to the zoo is an aquarium. Repeat after me. Aquarium. For those looking for a thrill, how about an amusement park? Repeat after me. Amusement park. For some culture and perhaps some music, you might need to go to a concert hall. A concert hall can range in size from something quite small to something very big. On a much bigger scale is a stadium. Repeat after me. Stadium. A stadium can be used for sports events or for bigger music events. Another term for a stadium is an arena. Repeat after me. Arena. A great place to visit in any city is the park. Repeat after me. Park. A place which is popular with children and typically found in a park is called the playground. Repeat after me. Playground. Another nice place to visit in a city is a square. This is what we call an open public space in a city centre. It can be used for community gatherings or even as a market as we discussed earlier. Another type of square in the city and sometimes a more grander affair is a plaza. Repeat after me. Plaza. Let's move on to cover some religious places you can visit in a city. A Christian place of worship is referred to as a church. Repeat after me. Church. A much bigger type of church is called a cathedral. Cathedral. And a much smaller type of church is called a chapel. These types of churches are usually connected to another building, like a hospital. A place of worship for Muslims is called a mosque. Repeat after me. Mosque. For those of the Jewish faith, the place they congregate is called the synagogue. Synagogue. And for lots of other religions, a temple is the place of worship. Repeat after me. Temple. A place which is commonly associated with worship is the graveyard. This is where the dead are buried. It may also be referred to as a cemetery. Repeat after me. Cemetery. Let's move on and take a look at some educational institutions. And first up we have school. Repeat after me. School. Other places of education in the city include a college or a university. Another place which offers a vital public service is a hospital. Repeat after me. Hospital. Another essential public service is the post office. 
This is the place where we can send our mail and it usually offers lots of additional services. A similar financial institution is the bank. Repeat after me. Bank. If you need cash in a city, an important place you can go is the ATM. This is the machine in which you can withdraw your money from your bank account. ATM. An important place for the emergency services is the fire station. Repeat after me. Fire station. For law enforcement, you would need to go to the police department. This can also be referred to as the police station. Another place associated with the legal system is the court. Repeat after me. Court. And this is where civil or criminal cases are overseen typically by a judge. Hopefully you won't have to visit a court too often. Next up we have a supermarket and this is where we can pick up all our daily items and food. Supermarket. The place you go to wash and clean your clothes is called the laundromat. Repeat after me. Laundromat. Another service which cleans your clothes is called the dry cleaners. Repeat after me. Dry cleaners. And what about if your car needs to be repaired? The place you go is called the auto repair shop. Repeat after me. Auto repair shop. In British English, this is referred to as the mechanics. Mechanics. For local residents who like to read, a library is an essential service. Repeat after me. Library. And for those who enjoy film, the movie theatre is a fantastic place to go. Movie theatre. This can also be referred to as the cinema. Repeat after me. Cinema. If you have the urge to get fit and exercise, the gym is the place for you. Repeat after me. Gym. Let's move on. A place where governance and democracy is at work is the city hall. Repeat after me. City Hall. If your city is a capital city, it may have some government buildings. This term covers lots of different types of government buildings, from the parliament to different types of ministries and civil service offices. And now it's time for two very undesirable places in a city which you would not want to go. First up, we have the dump dump and this is where all the garbage and trash from a city goes and our last location in our lesson is a prison this is where inmates and criminals are incarcerated under the legal system prison Hi, you're very welcome to another vocabulary video by LearningEnglishPro.com. This video will focus on vocabulary related to lots of kinds of transport. Make sure to subscribe. Now sit back, relax and repeat after me. Bus. Bus. Car. Car Motorcycle Motorcycle Taxi Taxi Tram 
tram. Bike. Bike. Walking. Walking. This is a pedestrian. Pedestrian. Train. Train. Truck. Truck. The subway. The subway. Helicopter. Helicopter. Aeroplane. Aeroplane. Hot air balloon. Hot air balloon. Drone. Drone. Airship. Airship. Jet. Jet. Rocket. Rocket. Space shuttle. Space shuttle. Cruise ship. Cruise ship. Yacht. Yacht. Ferry. Ferry. Jet ski. Jet ski. Rowing boat. Rowing boat. Gondola. Gondola. Submarine. Submarine. Hovercraft. Hovercraft. Horse riding. Horse riding. Tank. Tank. Tractor. Tractor. Today we're going on a fascinating journey into the world of bicycles. Whether you're a bike enthusiast or just starting your English learning journey, this lesson will equip you with useful words and knowledge. The complete word list and definitions for everything featured in this video are included in the description below, so make sure to check those out after the video. First up we have the handlebars. Handlebars are the steering control of the bicycle. You grip them to direct the bike's movement and change direction while riding. Handlebars. The frame is the main structure of the bicycle, providing support and stability. It connects all the components and determines the bike's overall shape and size. Frame. The saddle, also known as the seat, is where you sit while riding a bicycle. 
a comfortable saddle ensures an enjoyable and pain-free biking experience. Saddle Pedals are the foot-operated components of a bicycle. You place your feet on them to power the bike by pushing down and lifting alternately. Pedals Wheels are the circular components that enable the bike to move. They consist of the rim, spokes and tyre. The tyre provides traction and grip on the road. Wheels Next up we have the chain. The chain is a crucial part that transfers the pedaling power from the pedals to the rear wheel, making the bike move forward. Chain Brakes are essential safety equipment on a bicycle. They allow you to slow down or stop the bike when needed, ensuring a safe ride. Brakes Gears enable you to adjust the bike's resistance while pedaling. They come in handy for tackling hills or increasing speed on flat terrain. Gears The crankset connects the pedals to the chain. It plays a key role in transferring your pedaling energy to the bike's drivetrain. Crankset the derailleur is a device that shifts the chain between different gears, allowing you to adapt to various terrains and ride efficiently. Derailleur The freewheel allows the pedals to rotate freely when you're coasting without engaging the chain. It enables a smoother ride and saves your energy. Freewheel The fork connects the front wheel to the bike's frame. It helps with steering and ensuring stability while riding. Fork The headset is the part that allows the fork and the handlebars to rotate smoothly, facilitating easy steering. Headset Reflectors are safety devices attached to the bicycle. They reflect light from other vehicles, making you more visible to others, especially during low light conditions. Reflectors Lights are essential safety equipment for cycling in the dark. They illuminate the road ahead and help you stay visible to others. Lights a helmet is a crucial safety gear that protects your head in case of a fall or collision. It reduces the risk of head injuries while biking. Helmet A bell is a simple yet effective safety tool. It alerts pedestrians and other cyclists of your presence, promoting a safer riding environment. Bell A mirror mounted on the handlebars or helmet allows you to see what's behind you, improving awareness and safety on the road. Mirror A sturdy bike lock is essential for securing your bicycle when parked in public spaces, preventing theft. Lock A bike pump is a handy tool for maintaining proper tire pressure, ensuring a smoother and safer ride. Pump. Today we're delving into the dynamic field of emergency medicine. Whether you're a healthcare professional, a student, or simply interested in expanding your English vocabulary, you're in for an informative ride. All the terms covered in today's lesson are included for you in the word list in the video description, so check that out to revise all the terms after the lesson. 
If you're really interested in learning more medical English, you should definitely check out my channel Learning English Pro, where I have a vast assortment of medical related English vocabulary lessons. Medical related videos are my most popular topic on YouTube, so I'm constantly adding to this playlist every week. All the links for these videos and playlists are in the video description waiting for you. So if you're ready, let's begin our English lesson and we're going to start with the topic of today's lesson, emergency medicine. This is a medical speciality focused on the prompt assessment, diagnosis and treatment of acute illnesses and injuries. Emergency physicians work in emergency departments to provide immediate care and stabilize patients in critical conditions. Our next term is triage. Repeat after me, triage. Triage is the process of quickly assessing and prioritizing patients based on the severity of their condition. It ensures that those with the most urgent needs receive immediate attention. Triage. Trauma refers to physical injuries resulting from accidents, falls or violence. Emergency medicine often deals with trauma cases that require rapid intervention. Repeat after me. Trauma. Resuscitation involves efforts to revive or restore normal bodily functions in a patient experiencing cardiac arrest, respiratory failure or other life-threatening emergencies. Resuscitation Related to the term resuscitation, we have defibrillation. This is the delivery of an electric shock to the heart to restore its normal rhythm. Automated external defibrillators, or AEDs, are commonly used in emergency situations. Defibrillation We also have cardiopulmonary resuscitation, often called CPR. This is a life-saving technique that combines chest compressions and rescue breaths to maintain blood circulation and oxygenation in a person whose heart has stopped. Intubation involves inserting a tube into the airway to assist or secure the passage of air into the lungs. It is often performed in cases of respiratory distress. Repeat after me. Intubation. Our next term is epinephrine. Repeat after me. Epinephrine. This can also be known as adrenaline. It is a hormone and medication used in emergency situations to treat severe allergic reactions, also known as anaphylaxis, and cardiac arrest. Let's try it one more time. Epinephrine. Intravenous therapy, or IV therapy for short, involves giving fluids, medications, or blood products directly into a patient's veins, ensuring rapid absorption in emergency situations. So we have intravenous therapy, or the abbreviation is IV therapy. In the context of emergency medicine, shock is a life-threatening condition where insufficient blood flow to vital organs leads to cellular and organ dysfunction. Prompt intervention is crucial to prevent further complications. Shock. Our next term is hemorrhage. A hemorrhage is excessive bleeding and controlling it is a critical aspect of emergency medical care. Techniques like direct pressure and tourniquets may be used. Repeat after me, hemorrhage. A fracture is a break or crack in a bone. Emergency medicine addresses fractures with assessments, immobilization and referral to specialized care. Fracture.
Our next term is naloxone. This is a medication used to rapidly reverse opioid overdose by binding to opioid receptors, restoring normal respiration. Naloxone. Let's move on to seizure. A seizure is a sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain. A seizure can sometimes be referred to as a fit. This condition is supported with emergency medicine with medications and supportive care. Seizure. Decontamination involves the removal or neutralization of harmful substances from a person. This is often necessary in cases of chemical exposure or contamination. Decontamination. Today's crucial lesson is about first aid English. We'll cover essential phrases you need to know in emergency situations. And all the phrases covered in today's lesson are waiting for you in the video description if you want to follow along or revise. This lesson will be a lifesaver, so let's get started. In an emergency, asking the right questions is vital. Here are some key phrases. Are you okay? Where does it hurt? Can you breathe normally? Practicing these questions can help you assess the situation quickly and efficiently. Next, let's learn how to offer help. Being able to communicate effectively in these moments is crucial. I know first aid. Can I help? Stay calm. Help is on the way. Keep the wound clean and covered. These phrases are essential for providing immediate assistance and reassurance. Sometimes you may need to seek help from others. Here's phrases for what you could say. Call an ambulance immediately. We need a doctor. Is there a first aider nearby? Knowing how to call for help effectively can make all the difference in an emergency. Today we're diving into essential English phrases you might need in a hospital setting. Whether you're traveling, working or just expanding your vocabulary, this lesson is for you. All the phrases covered in today's lesson are waiting for you in the video description if you want to revise or follow along. Also in the video description is the link to my playlist on medical English, full of lots and lots of useful lessons. So let's get started. First, let's cover greetings and basic questions. In a hospital, you might need to ask for help or directions. Someone might ask you, how can I help you? We could respond, Hello, I am looking for the emergency department. Or we could say, I need to see a doctor. Or maybe you're visiting someone. I am visiting my aunt. Could you tell me her room number? Practice these phrases to feel confident in asking for initial assistance. Let's move on to phrases related to describing symptoms. A doctor or a nurse might ask you, what are your symptoms? They could also ask you, how are you feeling? I have a headache. I feel dizzy. My stomach hurts. Being clear about your symptoms will help medical professionals understand and assist you better. It's also important to understand common responses from medical staff. You may be asked some of the following things. 
Please fill out this form. Do you have any allergies? Follow me, please. Knowing these phrases helps you follow instructions and respond appropriately. In emergencies, knowing a few key phrases can be crucial. Call a doctor. It's an emergency. I need help immediately. These phrases are vital for urgent situations, so remember them well. Today we're delving into the world of over-the-counter medications, those readily available without a prescription. By the end of this video, you'll be bursting with lots of new English vocabulary. We are going to explore 12 popular medications you can buy over the counter. We're going to learn their pronunciation along with related symptoms, plus lots and lots of synonyms. Also, for every medication type, I will give you two phrases and questions for the pharmacy to really help contextualize the terms and boost your conversational skills. All the terms covered in today's lesson are waiting for you in the video description, along with links for lots of my other healthcare related English lessons. Let's dive into the world of self-care and medicine. And first, let's break down the term over-the-counter. This term refers to medications or products that are available for purchase without requiring a prescription from a healthcare professional. These products are typically deemed safe for use without direct supervision by a doctor and are accessible to consumers directly from pharmacies, drugstores, or other retail outlets. Let's move on to our medication types. An analgesic can also be known as a pain reliever and can help with lots of different types of pain, like a headache, toothache, dental pain, or even a backache. Another term for analgesic could be painkiller. Common examples of an analgesic include acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Let's take a look at our example sentences. Hi, I have a headache. Can you recommend an analgesic and advise on dosage? The term dosage or dose relates to the quantity of medicine you need to take for your condition. And this information will also tell you how many times a day you need to take it. Let's move on to our next example sentence. I have some dental pain. Could I get some aspirin, please? Aspirin is a common drug for relieving minor aches, pains, and fevers. People also use it as an anti-inflammatory or a blood thinner. Our next medication type is an antihistamine. Repeat after me. Antihistamine. This type of drug is used to treat allergies and it can also be referred to as allergy medication. An allergy is where your body reacts to something that's normally harmless, like pollen, dust, nuts, or animal fur. The symptoms can be mild, but for some people, they can be very serious. Examples of antihistamine drugs include loratadine and diphenhydramine. Let's move on to our example sentences. I have seasonal allergies. Which antihistamine do you suggest, and how often should I take it? I am suffering from some hay fever. Can you recommend an antihistamine? Hay fever is an allergic reaction to pollen, usually when it comes into contact with your mouth, nose, eyes, and throat. Pollen is a fine powder that comes from plants. Our next over-the-counter medication is a decongestant. Decongestants relieve nasal congestion. Nasal congestion is more commonly referred to as a stuffy nose or a blocked nose, and the medical term for this condition is rhinitis. Examples of this medication include pseudoephedrine and phenylephrine. I'm congested. Could you recommend a decongestant, and how often should I use it? I have a really stuffy nose. Which decongestant is the best, in your opinion? 
An expectorant helps loosen mucus. A more common term for an expectorant is cough medicine or cough syrup. This medicine helps with a condition known as a chest infection. And mucus is the slippery green substance that can cause congestion in our lungs when we're sick. It can also be referred to as phlegm. Wifenicin is a common example of an expectorant medication. Let's check out our example sentences. I have a chest infection with a lot of mucus. Which expectorant would you suggest? Hello, I need to get some cough medicine for my son. Which one is best for children? Another medication helped to use a cough is an antitussiv. An antitussiv suppresses coughing, so we can also call this medication a cough suppressant. This type of medication is usually given in the form of a syrup, just like the expectorant. A widely used cough suppressant is dextromethorphan. My cough is keeping me up at night. Can you recommend an antitussiv? And what's the recommended dosage? I've had a cough for a few days. Do you think I need an expectorant or a suppressant? Antacids neutralize stomach acid, relieving symptoms of indigestion and heartburn. Antacids are available in different forms of medication, such as liquids or chewable tablets. Common examples of antacid include Tums and Malox. I'm experiencing heartburn. Which antacid is effective? And how many tablets can I take at once? I have indigestion. Would you recommend a liquid or chewable tablet antacid? Let's move on to laxatives. Laxatives promote bowel movements and are helpful if one is suffering from constipation. There are lots of different types of laxatives. Common types include stimulants and bulk forming laxatives. I'm constipated and need a laxative. How long does it usually take to work? Hi, my elderly mother is having trouble with her bowel movements. Is there a laxative you could suggest for an older person? On the opposite side of the scale, we have an antidiarrheal. Antidiarrheals control diarrhea. With the word diarrhea, we have different spellings in American and British English. Diarrhea is when your stools are loose and watery. You may also need to go to the bathroom more often. And for this condition, lepuramide is a commonly used antidiarrheal. I have an upset stomach and diarrhea. Can you recommend an antidiarrheal and how often should I take it? I have had diarrhea for a few days. Can you suggest an antidiarrheal that is fast working and effective? Let's move on to topical analgesic. Topical analgesics relieve pain on the skin or muscles. This type of medication can be referred to as pain relieving cream or ointment. Examples of topical analgesics include creams or patches containing menthol or lidocaine. Let's check out our example sentences. I have muscle soreness. Would a topical analgesic like a menthol cream help and how often should I apply it? I have some muscle pain in my thigh. Could I have a skin patch with an analgesic? Our next over-the-counter medication is an antifungal. Antifungals treat fungal infections, such as athlete's foots or rashes of a similar type. Antifungals can sometimes be referred to as a fungicide. And clotrimazole is a common antifungal you can find in your pharmacy. I have a rash on my feet. Could you recommend an antifungal cream, please? 
I have a fungal infection under my arm. Could you suggest an antifungal suitable for that area? An antiseptic can be used to disinfect cuts and wounds. And they can also be referred to as disinfectants or germicides. Hydrogen peroxide and iodine are common antiseptics. I cut myself is an antiseptic like hydrogen peroxide suitable and how should I use it on the wound? I burnt myself last night on the stove. Could you suggest a mild antiseptic? Our twelfth and final medication type is motion sickness medication. These medications help prevent and relieve motion sickness. Motion sickness is having symptoms such as dizziness, nausea and vomiting while traveling. Common options for motion sickness medication include dimenhydrinate and mescalzine. Can you recommend a motion sickness medication and when should I take it before traveling? I get very sick when I'm a passenger in the car. Which medication is best for motion sickness? In this lesson, we will be exploring lots of interesting English vocabulary relating to winter. In fact, you'll find lots of really interesting English words. There is a lot of vocabulary to cover, so I'm going to break it down into three different categories. Weather, clothing, and cultural aspects of winter. So let's jump right in with our first category, which is winter weather. The main characteristic of winter weather is that it is cold. But there are lots of other words that we can use to describe the cold. Of course, we can say something simple, like it's really cold, but there are other words. We could say it is bitterly cold, or that the temperature is a bit nippy. We could also say that the temperature is quite chilly. The cold can also be described as biting. This would be a cold that you would feel quite strongly. And when it's really cold, you can get frost outside. This is the icy layer that covers everything, like grass and plants and cars. And of course, during winter, there's plenty of ice around as well. Ice covers lakes and roads and can make conditions quite dangerous. When there is ice outside in the environment, we simply say that it is icy outside. Let's take a look at some of the other words we can use to describe an icy environment. And we can also use words like frozen or frosty or freezing to describe an icy atmosphere. And another term we can use is slippery. We would say that the sidewalks, paths or roads are slippery, meaning that it's possible to fall or have an accident outside. Another aspect of winter weather is hail. Hail are pellets of frozen rain which fall in showers. And an individual piece of hail is known as a hailstone. No winter video would be complete without referencing snow. And while not everywhere will experience snow during winter, we have plenty of words to describe this weather event. When it snows, we can call the conditions snowy. And the fall of snow has its own word, snowfall. Sometimes you'll hear weatherman referring to a heavy snowfall or a light snowfall. And an individual piece of snow is known as a snowflake. If snow falls very heavily along with a strong wind, it can be known as a snowstorm. Our next term is sleet. Sleet is a mixture of rain and snow. It can be referred to as wet snow, or you'll hear someone say that the snow is very wet. We use the term melt to describe when the snow starts to disappear. When the liquid from snow mixes with dirt, we call this mixture slush. It's typically quite brown and very dirty looking. With all this cold weather, it's very vital to wear the correct clothing and use the right fabrics in wintertime. It's all about staying warm, and the first item we'll take a look at is a hat. And a cap is a popular type of hat to wear in winter to keep your head warm. 
And with all those wet conditions, you need to protect your feet. That's why a pair of boots are very, very essential. And in very wet weather, you may need a pair of rubber boots. That's what they're called in American English. And in British English, they're known as wellies. An important piece of clothing to keep your upper body warm is a good coat. A shorter version of a coat is known as a jacket. You will commonly hear people referring to their winter coat or their winter jacket. A piece of clothing which is commonly worn when it's snowy are the earmuffs. These are great to keep your ears warm when it snows and they're available for children and adults. A common material used in winter fabrics is fleece. This warm, fluffy material can be found in lots of different types of blankets. And when it comes to blankets at wintertime, there are lots of different options. A warm blanket that you use on your bed is known as a comforter in American English. Another type of blanket found in American culture is the quilt. This bed covering is made of different layers of fabric and kept in place with lines of stitching. A blanket which is filled with feathers and commonly found in European countries is the duvet. This is a French term, so we don't pronounce the T here. Duvet. Getting back to clothing, our next term is gloves. These are really essential for keeping your hands warm. Another type of glove which you'll find in wintertime are mittens. These are gloves with two sections, one for your thumb and the other for all four fingers. Our next term is British English, the jumper. And of course, this is a garment you wear on your upper body and it typically has long sleeves and you put it on over your head. In American English, it is known as a sweater. A sweater which is very common in the wintertime is the turtleneck. This is an American term for a sweater with a high collar. In British English, it is known as a polo neck. Something which a lot of the items of clothing we've discussed have in common is that they are made of wool. This is the fabric that we get from a goat or a sheep or a similar animal. Items of clothing made from wool can be described as woolen or as knitwear. My favourite piece of knitwear at wintertime is the scarf. This is a piece of fabric which we wear around our necks and on our chest to keep us warm. And to keep your feet nice and toasty, you'll need a very good pair of socks. And for around the house, you can get a good pair of slippers. They are really useful, particularly when it's very, very cold. Our final piece of clothing before moving on to our next category is the hoodie. A hoodie is a sports top and the most important aspect is that it has a hood. This is the part that goes over your head and lots of jackets and coats will also have a hood to protect you on a rainy or stormy day. Our final category is where we will take a look at how winter affects our culture and language as well as different items we associate with wintertime. In the Northern Hemisphere, the season of winter covers the months of December, January and February, while in the Southern Hemisphere, it covers the months of June, July and August. The season of winter can also be known as wintertime. In nature, evergreen trees such as the spruce or fir are some of the trees which maintain their green colour and are associated with winter culture. We call these types of trees evergreen trees. Also in nature, plenty of animals such as bears and bats go through a process called hibernation. This is where the animal goes into a dormant state during the winter time. And with the changing position of the sun, nighttime hours grow longer. And most countries around the world change clocks. This is done in winter time to add additional hours of daylight during the working day. Lots of our winter vocabulary focuses on cold weather and keeping warm. So it's no surprise that fire has lots of associations with winter. And a domestic fire can take place in the fireplace. The fireplace can usually be found in a living room area or in a kitchen. And we use firewood or coal as fuel for a fire. The smoke from a fire will emerge from a chimney. 
and a chimney can usually be found on the roof of a house. If you don't have a fireplace, you might have a heating system. With some heating systems, you may have one or more radiators around your house. Radiator is a term from British English, while we can use the word heater more generally. Houses in colder climates will also need insulation. Materials like fiberglass can be packed into the walls and in the roofs of homes to keep them warm by trapping heat in the house. Next up, let's check out some sports associated with winter. First up, we have ice hockey, which is hugely popular in Canada and the United States of America. And our next sport is skiing, which is quite similar to snowboarding. And if you like to get out on the ice, ice skating could be for you. A huge aspect of culture at wintertime is, of course, Christmas and the mythological character of Santa Claus. In fact, there's so much vocabulary relating to Christmas and the holiday season that I've given it its own playlist. The link for this huge playlist is on screen right now, and I've also linked all the videos in the description below. So make sure to check those out to really boost your Christmas English vocabulary. Other important religious and cultural celebrations held in wintertime include Hanukkah, the winter solstice, Kwanzaa, Chinese horoscopes, and the Three Kings Day. Another big moment for celebration is New Year's Eve on December 31st. And of course, we have to mention St. Valentine's Day, a day celebrating love of all types held on February the 14th. Let's move on to some useful items you can use in wintertime, like the sledge. A sledge is a simple vehicle on runners which can convey passengers over snow and ice, and it looks like a lot of fun as well. Another handy item to have at hand is the snow shovel. In snowy climates, you'll often see people use their snow shovel to clear their driveway. And our final item is the umbrella. It might not be too great when it snows, but for all the rain that can occur in wintertime, it's definitely an essential item. Today we are unlocking the world with essential English travel phrases and vocabulary. Whether you're booking a table or checking out the local sites, these phrases and words will be your trusty guide. So if you're ready, let's embark on this linguistic journey. The first word in our word list is accommodation. Accommodation means the places where you stay on your travels. Accommodation can include hotels, a hostel, staying with family or friends, or even camping. Someone might ask you, where are you staying? Or do you have accommodation? And we can say, I have accommodation in a local hotel. Or we could say, I am staying in the Blue Moon Hostel in the city centre. Let's move on to our next term, which is itinerary. Repeat after me, itinerary. An itinerary is your travel plan, including destinations and activities. Synonyms for itinerary include travel plans or travel arrangements. Someone might ask you, what are your plans for your trip to Berlin? Or someone might ask you, what is on your itinerary for your weekend in Berlin? We could reply with, our itinerary includes a trip to the Brandenburg Gate. Or we could say, we are planning an itinerary which includes several historic sites. Are you ready for another English term? It's a really important one when you're traveling. Reservation. Repeat after me. Reservation. A reservation is a booking for a service such as a hotel room, a restaurant table, or perhaps a tour. Let's check out some synonyms for this word. They include booking, appointment, or arrangement. You could be asked, do you have a reservation? Or 
Have you made a reservation? You may ask, do I need a reservation or can I make a reservation? We can also say things like, I have a reservation for eight o'clock under the name Jones. Or how about, I would like to make a reservation for tomorrow night for six people. Money is an important topic when we travel and our next term is currency. Currency means the type of money used in a particular country or region. Let's use this term in a few sentences. I need to change my money to the local currency. What currency do they use in Spain? What is the exchange rate on Turkish currency at the moment? Let's move on to our fifth term. We're halfway through and it is fare. This word relates to the fee paid for a journey on public transportation. And to confuse you a little, it has the same pronunciation as the adjective or adverb fare. However, the spelling is slightly different. When we use the word fare, it is typically coupled with the form of transport used, like bus fare, plane fare, train fare, or taxi fare. Let's check out our example phrases. How much is the plane fare to Mumbai? The train fare from London to Manchester is very expensive. Can you tell me the fare for the bus to the airport? Immigration. Repeat after me. Immigration. This is the place at the airport where officials check your passport and visa. What documents do I need to show at immigration if I'm visiting as a tourist? How long does immigration usually take to go through in LAX? Our seventh term is luggage. Repeat after me, luggage. The term luggage relates to bags and suitcases packed with personal belongings for travel. A common synonym of luggage is baggage. Let's take a look at our phrases. What is the weight limit on luggage for this flight? My luggage consists of two suitcases and a small bag. You might be asked, do you have any luggage? How many pieces of luggage are you bringing on your trip? Our next term can be the very purpose of some vacations. Tourist attraction. Tourist attraction. And this is simply a place of interest where tourists visit, typically for its cultural value, historical significance, natural or built beauty. If inquiring about tourist attractions, you could say, what are the must-see tourist attractions in this city? Can you recommend a tourist attraction that is good for kids? Or maybe you want to suggest a place for someone to visit. You could say, Christchurch in Dublin is a popular tourist attraction. And if you want lots of suggestions for a place you're visiting, why not get a guidebook? A guidebook is a book of information about a place designed for the use of visitors or tourists. Synonyms for guidebook could be tourist guide or travel guide. Can you suggest a good guidebook for visiting Prague? The guidebook recommends a noodle bar on 7th Street. Let's move on to our final term for this lesson, which is customs. Repeat after me, customs. Customs is the place at an airport or country's border where a traveler's luggage is examined for prohibited or taxable goods. Do I need to declare at customs if I'm bringing food or electronics? 
The customs in Australia are known for being very strict. And now it's over to you. Imagine you're in your dream city. Drop a creative sentence in the comments using some of the vocabulary you've learned in today's lesson. And great job today. You've really boosted your English vocabulary on the topic of traveling. You're now better prepared to navigate your travels with confidence. If you found this lesson informative, make sure to subscribe to Learning English Pro. Keep learning and exploring with Learning English Pro. Check out the additional videos I have on lessons relating to travel. That's all for today, folks. Thanks for joining me. And remember, keep learning English like a pro.